nobody really wants to break an agreement on soft goals, even knowing that maybe they'll never have to achieve them anyway. And if they're soft enough, the world can say we're doing something, it's a big step forward, but it isn't quantitatively seriously addressing the challenge. The optimists will say, well, get your toe in the water, get started, and we'll become uh, more and more ambitious over time, and that's a plausible uh, view. The pessimists will say, well, you see, you've given it up, uh, and uh, this is, continues to be show just like Kyoto was, and both sides will continue to argue. When it comes to adaptation, we're actually much farther behind because even how to adapt to climate change is a scientifically and socially uh, and in an engineering sense a very difficult, complex problem. You have to really know the territory and you have to really understand in a way that most places do not and most scientists do not the interaction of ecology and human systems and the economy and the crop productivity and the water reservoirs and lots of things that are hard to model and that in 99% of the world have never been modeled. And yet we're supposed to now start taking steps on adaptation. There are very few people trained in the world to do this. So it isn't even a scientific discipline that's trained how do you adapt to climate change? Uh, it's interdisciplinary. It's quite complex. Downscaling climate models is not easy. Many problems. We have an institute devoted to that, and I'd say we're groping for ways to develop tools for this, but uh, it's not easy to do, and that's bringing some of the world's most creative people together at a great university, and in the rural areas of the poor world being hit over the head by this dramatically, there's almost nothing going on. So the adaptation side is a, is a very serious problem. The technology transfer issue is almost at zero uh, because while the developing countries really insist on this, the rich countries are quite ambivalent and confused about it and hope that a few uh, maybe symbolic things or a few joint research and development and demonstration projects will fill that category. The rich countries, starting with us, say, well, most of this technology is privately owned, it's patent uh, protected and so on, what do you want us to do? And the poor countries are saying, you want us to pay royalties to start cleaning up when you made the mess, you're making the damage, you're doing the disproportion, and you expect us on top of that to pay for the knowledge that's needed to do this. And so there's no meeting of the minds whatsoever on this. And it's basically an empty chapter as far as I can see up until now. It would, create, it would require a tremendous amount of goodwill and a tremendous amount of creativity to uh, put something really, truly useful in place, and I don't see either happening right now. Then the fourth area, if that one is near zero, I believe the fourth one is at zero, uh, the financing. Rich countries, well, let's start with us. We don't like to spend anything for anyone else in the world, period. That's a pretty deep US political position right now. We hate foreign aid as, a, uh, as an official, uh, as an, as an official uh, long-standing bipartisan view of the world. To say all of a sudden in the middle of this crisis, we're going to take on more obligations and, are, do I hear you right, pay for someone else to do this too? Are you kidding? That, to me, is more or less the median view in Congress and in this country. Whereas from the rest of the world's point of view, the position is a completely different one. You're asking us, after you have filled the atmosphere with 110 parts per million of carbon, you've wrecked our climate, you've lied, I'm going to use strong words, but after all, these are very poor people, 
you've lied about development assistance for 50 years, you've made promises you've never fulfilled, and now you're saying, yes, you have to undertake these things, things that you've not even accepted as real up until this government, and if we don't do it, you're gonna block our goods from entering your country, which is another wrinkle of the discussion. So to my mind, this is a pretty serious, pretty serious gap. Uh, and I take the developing country side, I have to say, in all of this, because I think that America has made a big mistake for a long time in thinking that the rest of the world can more or less just go away or it can be handled by military approaches and that our failure to invest even fractions of 1% of our income to solve some of these deeper problems is a huge moral shortcoming, but also a huge practical shortcoming. So I don't sympathize with our point of view, but I do think that that's a reflection of what the US political scene is right now. It's hard enough, any congressman will tell you, to get agreement on anything about this for the US but to think that we're gonna pay for someone else to do it is another matter. What the US will hope for as Europe, uh, the two donor regions of the world, is that symbolic amounts of money will somehow make people happy. And we have funded something called the Global Environment Facility for, I don't remember exactly when it started, but for at least 10 years, charged with this responsibility but for 100 or 200 million dollars a year, which is nothing for five billion people in the developing world facing a cascade of crises. So this, to my mind, is a, a huge barricade. One more word about our internal negotiation. We're in the process of uh, watching Congress behind closed doors negotiate uh, a first draft of a uh, climate bill, the so-called uh, Markey-Waxman or Waxman-Markey uh, legislation, which they're hoping to report out of committee by Memorial Day weekend. That is a 648 page, at least for the moment, it's gonna expand, I think, uh, piece of legislation based around the idea of cap and trade uh, as a basic mechanism for limiting greenhouse gas emissions. Of course, passing this uh, would be a step forward. My own view, we can discuss it, is that it's a kind of, uh, it, it, it's kind of a, it's not, not a great strategy. Uh, I think there are more strategic things that can be done than uh, that very long list of uh, non-prioritized items in this vast piece of legislation. I'm a little bit uh, unhappy that, uh, that President Obama has not put forward a plan, but rather uh, let Congress negotiate a legislative approach, because I think more than a piece of legislation, we need a, a plan, actually. We need a strategy. And we're not really getting the strategy yet. What is likely to happen is well, let me stop here. We'll, we'll turn okay, to we'll discussion it. at this point. <clears throat>